Would you pray with me this morning? God, we take great uh, comfort in your absolute knowledge of us, your intimate awareness of what our needs are and what our weaknesses are. And Lord, because we're your children and because you're our King, our Father, our Savior, our Lord, that brings us peace to know that you are strength, that we can turn to you, we can run to you, we can bring our requests to you, we can open up our hearts to you, and, and God, you provide. Lord, I pray as we look at your word today, that you make it so clear to us that with Holy Spirit-driven insight, God, we would know what you, what you want from us, we would know how to do it, and God, more than that, more than just information, God, we receive power from you to do these things, God, for your glory. God, I pray that joy would be the result, that joy would prevail, that we would know truly what it is to have joy in you. So God, teach us, guide us, lead us, change us today. A way that causes you to be made greater, causes you to be known more clearly, causes us to enjoy you more, causes this world to see you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As you know, the theme of joy is a pervasive one in Paul's letter to the Philippians. And most people associate the book with joy almost, almost completely. In fact, 16 different times Paul references some form of the word joy in this. But you know, when Paul talks about joy in, in the book of Philippians or his letter to the Philippians, it's not joy in a vacuum. I mean, it's joy in the context of real life, of real struggles, of real difficulties, of, of real hardship. I think sometimes when the Christian community or when churches talk about joy, I think sometimes the, the lost world or the secular community, the unchurched folks, they listen to that with more than a bit of cynicism. Because they think of it, I think, in one of two categories. Either one, that's just a group of people who have never experienced real hardship or real pain or real suffering. You know, if they've been through what I've been through, if they had to face what I faced, then they wouldn't be like they are. They wouldn't be able to talk about joy like they do. Of course, you know that's not true. Because in this room are people who are well acquainted with suffering and loss and hardship and grief and pain and difficulty and betrayal and all those things. Sometimes I think also that the world looks at this when we talk about joy and says, this is just pretense. They're, they're, just, they're just faking it. They, they talk about joy because they're supposed to, but they're no different than I am. Well, unfortunately, that may sometimes be the case. Sometimes joy is, is lacking in us. And where joy is lacking, God is not glorified. Where joy is absent in your life and my life, God is not seen as he really is. God is not seen clearly. Because God saved us for joy, joy in him. God saved us to change us and that we would enjoy that change. In fact, what God did through Jesus Christ was to bring us to himself so that we could find our greatest and highest and deepest desires met in him. And that's, that's what real joy is. When you get to the third chapter of this letter that Paul wrote, he says this in verse 1. He says, finally, my brothers, here's a definitive statement, a concluding sort of statement. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Again, that's just one of 16 or more times that he references this theme, this idea, this, this concept of joy. When you get to chapter 4, verse 4, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now, when you think about something when it comes to joy here that that you may have not considered before. Joy is a command. This is an expectation of God that you and I will follow, that you and I will obey. Paul is telling us, under the inspiration of God's Spirit, to do this. And that flies in the face of what most of us think about joy. That's quite a different spin on the idea. See, for many of us, we're waiting for joy to come to us. We're waiting for something to happen so we can finally have it. And if this happens, then I'll have joy. And many of us live in that captivation, that, that sort of bondage, that if-then struggle. And we've got this long list in our minds of all the things it would take, or, or maybe we just think it's a few things, or for some of you who are a little more focused, just one thing, if I get this, or if this happens, then I'll have joy. Some of us who have maybe lived a little longer, some of you who have grown a little wiser than the rest of us, you know that not to be the case because when that list was filled in at some point in your life, if, if I could just have this, then I'll be happy. You found out it really wasn't enough. 
Or maybe it was short-lived, and then there was something else, and something else, and something else. That's not what Paul is talking about. Paul is not talking about a feeling or an emotion. He's not talking about a set of advantageous circumstances. He's not talking about when life gets better, things get happier. He's talking about a choice that you make because of the relationship you have with God through Jesus Christ. You can choose joy. Joy is available to you. It's a gift of God to you. It's a fruit of the work of the Holy Spirit in you. But you've got to choose this. You've got to go after this. You've got to obey God in this. You see, when Paul talks about joy, his idea of joy is gladness in God by the work of the Holy Spirit through the ministry or by the work of Christ through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But joy can't be. Joy can't be, at least if Paul is telling the truth here. And I'm going to make the assumption that he is like you are. Joy can't be based on our circumstances if joy is real. It it absolutely can't be. It can't be based on just good things happening in your life. Like if I were to ask you this morning, a lot of people probably did, as you were walking in, as you were shaking hands, greeting people, hey, how are you this morning? Most of you probably gave the cursory response, I'm fine, how are you? Now for some of you, you really are fine. This has been the best week you've had in a while. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who I haven't talked to in a couple of months, and, and you know, fine, it's the best it's been. But, you know, I've had a week like this or a month like this since I can't remember when. That's, that's happiness. But what happens to the person whose hand you shake, you say, hey, how you're doing? And instead of saying fine, they give you the honest answer. Man, it's terrible. Yeah, I've had the worst week or the worst month or the worst six months. Now, honestly, some of us don't want to hear that. Whoa, whoa, that's too much information. I was just expecting the fine. i got other hands to shake here. What about that person who's struggling? What about joy? If we think joy is just based on good things happening to us or people being nice to us or things happening in a way that we think is fair or right or our circumstances all lining up properly, then we're not ever going to have joy like God commands and like Paul experienced. If Paul's joy was real, then it's in spite of what happened because he had no external rationale for joy, at least not in the context of this letter. Listen to some of the things that Paul has been through. If you quote Paul's writings to the Philippians, the Colossians, to the Corinthians, etc., he would tell you things like this. He's worked much harder than most. He's been in prison more frequently than most. Flogged more severely. Exposed to death again and again. Five times he received 39 lashes. Three times beaten with rods. One time stoned. Three times shipwrecked. Spent a night and a half in the open sea. Constantly on the move. In danger from rivers, bandits, his own countrymen, um, Gentiles, Jews, In the city, in the country, he's gone without sleep, gone without food, gone without drink, been cold, been naked, and he bears the stress, which he writes about the concern of all these churches. If Paul were writing down, here is my life, you can see why I've got joy, you'd say, no, I don't see it. So it's got to be more. It's got to be something bigger. It's got to be something deeper, because Paul wrote this in Philippians 1, 18 and 19. He says, I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. So here's a man two years in a Roman prison, writing a letter for the joy of other believers, and he's telling them, I will rejoice. I just want you to let all that information just settle in on you for a moment. For all of us who are unhappy with life, or worse, unhappy with God, because things are not like we want them to be, not like we've hoped for, not like we've expected, and we've got this idea of when this happens, then I'll finally have joy. That's absent. That's foreign to the concept of joy in the Bible. See, what we're actually talking about is subjective happiness. Subjective happiness. And that's very different than objective joy. You ever heard someone say to you or say to someone else, hey, whatever makes you happy. All of us have different ideas of what a a happy experience would be or what a good day would be or or what would bring us some gladness. That's subjective. It's short-lived. For some of us, it lasts a little bit longer. we lived in South Florida for so many years, and over the years we had annual passes to Walt Disney World. And, and so we'd go rather frequently, and we could do it differently than, than people who weren't from there. We could go, and we could go for a few hours or a few days, and we didn't have to wait in line because we knew we could always come back later. You know, we'd just take it easy and do it differently. And we always wondered about those families who traveled from so far away, who had saved so much money for so long to make a trip of such magnitude and wondered when they got there and all this heat and all these crowds and all this, was it worth it for them? You guys have to answer that. And when you had all that joy and you're walking out of that park that night and you're exhausted and the kids are crying, you've got a balloon in one hand and you've got, you know, you've got a bag of popcorn in the other because they're still selling it to the very last second as you go out the door and 
how long until it's faded. And so much of the rest of life fades just like that. But what about objective joy? So when the Bible talks about joy, it's not the idea of God wants to give you whatever it is that will make you happy. Now here's a little test case we can do for that. When you think of heaven, what do you think of? When you think of heaven, what comes to your mind first? What, what is heaven to you? See, this is almost like a so, sort of spiritual slash psychological exam here. When you think of heaven and those things that flashed in your mind first or what you think heaven is going to be like and what you're going to enjoy, you're already showing, you're revealing where your real worship is. You're revealing what God to you is. What you delight in is this. What is, what is heaven to you? Beautiful, wide fairways with holes about this big at the end. Sunshine, pretty lake with a clear bottom. A, you know, what is it for you? That's what you take your delight in. That's what you take your joy in. But the image that ought to come to our minds when we first think of heaven is God. That we get to be with God. We get to see God. We get to enjoy God. We get to know God even as we're known by God. That's the issue. Whatever makes you happy is not what God promised. What God promised is this, that you could find joy in Him, in Him alone. Why did Jesus forsake the glories of heaven? Why did He leave a, leave a place where He was worshipped continuously without the existence of time? Why would Jesus let go of His grip of that in order to condescend to this earth to be born in the most humble of environments, to, to live as He did in, in, in poverty, and then to suffer and to bleed and to die, and all that He did. Why, why did He do all of that for us? Just so He could make you happy? Just so He could give you more stuff? Just so that you could be prosperous or successful at work? No, He did it for something so much bigger than that that they can't even compare it to. Here's what the Scripture says in 1 Peter 3.18. Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Do you know why? You know what the rest part of that verse is? Christ suffered for sins once, the righteous for the unrighteous. Why? So that He could bring you to God. To God. So that He could bring you to your God-created heart's desire. So that He could get you to the place where joy is genuinely found in Him. That's the message of God. So what do you desire most? What do, you, what do you want most? What is it in your life that you think would make you the happiest? That, by some definitions or many definitions, is your God. Where your heart's desire is. Let me ask you this about God. Do you desire Him more than anything else? To know Him? To enjoy Him? To experience Him? To please Him? To honor Him? Do you desire that more than anything else? Or are you like many people who claim the mantle or the title of Christian who just know about God? Your, your, your mind is full of doctrine about God. And you could argue many finer points of theology. And, and that's not unimportant. I'm, I'm a big doctrinal person. I believe much in the significance of doctrine. But doctrine by itself is not enough. You see, Satan right now knows more doctrine about God. He'll, he'll think more doctrinally, theologically true thoughts while we're having this worship service today, then you'll think for the rest of your life. He knows more about the intricacies of the theology and doctrine of God than you and I will ever know. His problem is not doctrine. His problem is desire. God is not what He desires or who He desires. Oh, He knows the information. And that's why the Scriptures can tell us something so challenging like this. The devils also believe and they tremble. To get these facts aligned right, to develop a system that's that's coherent and, and the pieces fit well is not enough. It's to love God with all your heart. When Jesus was asked, what's most important, teacher, rabbi? I mean, we hold pages upon pages of Scripture, they said, talking about the Old Testament, as we would call it, these Hebrew Scriptures. And they said, of all of this, what's, what's first, what's most, what's greatest? What did Jesus say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. So that's first, it's greatest, it's most. It's, it's to desire God. You know, a lot of people today, a lot of people today doubt their salvation in churches. They struggle with it all the time. They, they hear a message that convicts or challenges, and they, they, they struggle. They're in and out of this doubt. And, 
as I shared with you last week on the Sunday night message, I, I believe this, I've come to believe this over time. It's not my responsibility nor yours as a Christian to help someone overcome doubt when that doubt could be pointing to a serious problem. In, in other words, I believe when someone legitimately doubts, they doubt legitimately. They doubt for a reason. And if there's no burning desire for God, that God's pleased with you, no burning desire to know God, to really understand the mind of God, no, no burning desire to, to love God and to experience His love in your life, if God is just an afterthought for you, something that you engage in on Sunday mornings or periodically during the week during time of crisis or, or something that might strike a memory, if God is just a flavoring to the rest of your life, you ought to wonder, is He your highest and greatest desire? That's what God wants. That's what God desires more than anything else. And that's why we have such a tragically flawed approach when it comes to God and joy. Now, I wish I had more time to develop this. This is probably conference or, or at least extended series worthy, but I want to hit this just very, very briefly. Here's where so many miss the point when it comes to God and joy. And this is also, by the way, the primary basis of the modern false American prosperity gospel. And, th and that's this, and I can summarize it in a statement. It's the false, misguided, I'll say from the pits of hell, demonic belief that God exists to provide you with the things that will give you joy. That's not what God is for. And so when God doesn't come through with the things you think or hope, the if-then things that give you joy, when God doesn't give them, what happens? You have a crisis of faith. You have a struggle with doubt. Why is God not doing these things for me? You know, if God promises me health, why am I still struggling with my health? If God wants me to be wealthy, why am I still struggling paying these bills? Why, why, am I, why are the collectors still calling me? If God's primary purpose is just that I be happy, as so many Christians say, I can't tell you how many people, particularly, by the way, men, this points much more often at you than women, that's not scientific, that's just anecdotal by observation, sitting in an office, struggling with faithfulness in their marriage, usually have already cheated on their spouse, and they come up with this lame, demonic theology that they think they can find somewhere in the Bible, which they can't, which says, well, doesn't God just want me to be happy? Have we relegated the God of glory, the King of creation, the Savior of mankind, to simply some sort of spiritual genie in a bottle that if we say it in the right way, or if we speak it believing it, or if we say it often enough that He is bound by our commands and wishes to deliver, that's not what God is about. That's not what God has promised to do. And here's our tragic approach. We approach God as a supernatural means to our own ends. And so when I'm talking about joy and choosing joy, here's the way the Christian, modern Christian translation also is. Oh, I get it. Instead of working so hard myself to go after all these things that I know are going to bring me joy or gladness or happiness, here's what I do now that I'm a Christian. I trust God to give me those things instead. And so instead of me working for them, I'll believe. I'll have faith, quote unquote. I'll speak it. God will deliver it. And if I pray hard enough, work hard enough, want enough, then God will deliver the things that make me happy. And we use God. Do you see the difference? Nod your head if you're with me. Let me give you a passage of Scripture here. Look at James chapter 4. You can write this reference down. I don't think I put it in your notes today. James chapter 4, verse 3. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people. Now listen to what he said. Jesus tells us, here's the message of God. You're asking and you don't get. And here's why I'm not giving it to you. You're asking wrongly because you just want to consume it. It's just your lust. It's just the stuff that you want. It's the desires of your eyes, of your flesh, the stuff you want. I'm not giving it to you. Why? Because you're an adulterous people. It's God saying to us, you don't love me with your whole heart. I, I'm not your greatest desire. You want things from me so that you could use them to pursue what is your real heart's desire. And that makes you an adulterer. It's, it's like the woman who would go to her husband and say, honey, I, you know, I need $100. That, you know, just, I've got some things I need to do. I need you to give me $100. And then takes that $100 and spends it that weekend with her lover in a hotel. That's what we want to do with God. I can remember when I was in college, this is a horrible, horrible confession that I'll make to you to drive the point home. For the sake of the message, I'll subject myself to this confession. 
Cecilia and I had just begun to date. That's my caveat. That's my sandbagging. So there was no exclusivity here. I just want that to be known for the record. We had just begun to date, and, and my car was broken down. And so I asked her if I could borrow her car for the weekend. Now, I had an old car. I had a Pacer. Cecilia had a brand new Honda Accord. So you can see the disparity there. And asked her if I could borrow her car to drive home for the weekend from college. And so I took her car for the weekend. And of course, when I got home, I was kind of bored. And there was this girl I used to date. And the short version is I took her out in Cecilia's car. Cecilia found out about it. It was a bad scene. You took someone else out in my car. James 4, 3. <laughs> but, but that's what we do with God. Every single time. We're using him for stuff. And stuff can be anything. That's a huge word. So all we've done is we've Christianized or sort of pseudo-baptized the same desires we had before Christ. We still think our joy is going to be found in the same stuff everyone else does. We still think happiness is found there and all of that. The only difference we have in the world is we think Jesus is going to give it to us or even worse, he's bound to give it to us. And that's not what Paul is talking about here. You see, God has never promised us joy in general. That's not in the Bible. But that's why some of you are struggling with your faith. That's why some of you are having a hard time emotionally. Because you think that, that God has just promised you non-specific, whatever makes you happy, gladness. But it's not there. What God has promised is, is joy in Himself. And there's a huge difference. Joy in Himself. He's not promised you that just do what you want and I'll bless it. Ask for whatever you will and I'll give it. Go out there and live and have fun because that's what I'm, that's what I'm all about. No, what He's promised you is joy and He wants you to have joy, an everlasting, durable joy, but He wants you to have that in the pursuit of Him, in knowing Him. And loving Him. And that's the difference. So I want to go through this list very quickly. And I want to just quickly review for you these things that we see in Paul's life. This is not an exhaustive list. So you may think of a list that starts with the number 8 in the context of a message has got to be a very long list. I want to remind you as you look at this list before I begin, remind you of the favorite verse of all preachers. Philippians 3.1, that first verse again. Finally. Finally. What does that mean when a preacher says finally? Not a lot. But finally, I want to give you this list that shows you sort of a course of Paul's experience as he recounts it to the Philippians. This is what he's written so far. Here's how we find joy. Well, one is sort of the overview statement. It's this. You can choose joy and you can find your joy if you will start doing this. If you will forsake your pursuit of joy through Christ and instead pursue joy in Christ. I guess that's the starting point. And I'm sure that's something that Apostle Paul had discovered. That he is not here to get me out of hardship. You remember even the prayers that Paul prayed? Paul had a, a lasting, he had a lifelong struggle with faith and prayer with one particular issue, an issue that much speculation has, has come about. You know, we don't know what his thorn in the flesh was, right? We, we really don't know. But he prayed about it. He asked God for it. And he finally realized that in his weakness, God was made strong. In his imperfections, God was made perfect. And, and the result of that, whatever it was, an infirmity, a struggle, a difficulty, a weakness, a pain, a condition, that in that he could rely on God more. God never took it away. And what he began to learn, I'm sure, and you see it through all of his writings, is this, is that it's not joy through Christ. It's joy in Christ. It's not him doing what I want him to do, giving me what I think I need, um, answering all my requests. It's not me asking so I can consume it on my own lust. Give me this and then I'll be happy. It's saying, God, I could lose all of that. You can take it all away. You could take every resource I've got. You could take every friendship I've got. You could take all the freedom I've got. You could take all the comfort I've got. You can put me in a prison. You can put me in a ship that's sinking. You could put me at the bad end of a Roman soldier's whip. You can do all these things for me, but I've still got you. And when I've got you, I've still got joy. So you can choose that. Number two, you can choose to be thankful rather than ungrateful. And this is simple stuff here, but, but so significant. Ingratitude 
In fact, ingratitude is almost to the extreme end. Many of us are not ungrateful per se. We just live as if we're unaware of what God is doing. Gratitude, thankfulness, has to be active. It it can't be passive. You're not in just a general state of thankfulness. No, I'm thankful. Sure, I'm thankful. Like you say to your kids sometimes, you guys don't appreciate anything. Oh, yeah, we do. We appreciate all that you do. No, real thankfulness is active, and it's specific. When was the last time you sat down and in your prayer time went through, God, I'm so thankful that you're doing this, this, and this? Because I can tell you human nature is this. Our focus is on all that's messed up, all that's wrong, all that's hurting, all that's painful. When was the last time our focus was different? And I'm thinking of Paul, and it seems rather simple, but here's Paul in a Roman prison where he's been writing for two years, and he writes these words, I thank my God and all my remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. Now that's, that's pretty profound to me. Every single time I pray, I'm praying a prayer of thanks. And specifically in this context, he's thanking them for them and their partnership in the gospel. You can do that. You can choose in every context to pray with thankfulness and see what God is doing. Number three, you can choose to place an ultimate value on God's kingdom. Now this is a big topic, and again, I hate to just hit it so lightly here. But here's what drove Paul, and I pray that in increasing measure this would drive us personally and drive us collectively. It's this sense that if everything seems to be wrong in this world, and if everything seems to be askew and it's, it's hard and it's painful and all those things, when everything is awry here, as long as the advance of God's kingdom is taking place, I'm good with that. Because Paul had gotten to the point where he sacrificed himself for that greater cause. As long as the message of who Jesus is is going out, and by the way, as I mentioned before in this series, in our times of pain and hardship and difficulty, when you're faithful and when you're finding reasons to choose joy and you're still loving Him the same and trusting Him the same and worshiping Him the same, that is a powerful witness. That's a powerful witness. People would expect you to be full of joy when God is blessing you, when things are going your way, but if you can be like Job and honor Him when He's not, that's profound. That's, that's unusual. That's, that's a powerful tool God uses. And you can choose to do this. You can place ultimate value on God's kingdom. Now again, as I said, a big subject. It's that growing, shifting mindset, that spiritual development in me that says, you know what? Why do I care so much about this stuff? This stuff is so temporal. This stuff is, is, is so meaningless in, in the big scheme of things, and it's so short-lived. Why am I not caring about things that matter? Why not, am I not caring about things that last? Why am I not caring about things that are eternal? Look what he says. He says, Most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. And then he speaks about those who are doing it for wrong reasons, some from rival envy, etc. Some do it out of love, verse 16. Verse 17, rivalry. But here's what he says, verse 18. He said, People become bold because of my imprisonment. So even this hardship has served a purpose. He says, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. That's a person who cared more about the things of God and the kingdom of God than he did about his own little kingdom, his own little personal world. Because his own little world was a mess. His own little world was in a tiny cell. But he saw the kingdom of God advancing. And as long as our focus is just on me and my stuff and and my struggles and my difficulties, it's easy to be deceived to be deceived about the fairness of God, to be deceived about the power of God, to be deceived about the work of God. But when I can get outside of me and say, you know what, this is happening to me, but God is still doing this and this and this and this, and that's powerful stuff and joy is found in that. And that's where he found his joy. And the more our focus is on his kingdom and not ours, the more we can find and choose joy. Number four, we can choose to trust in his sovereignty, his control, his power over everything, rather than worrying about things outside of our control. How many of you are worrying about something that you cannot control? Christians were being persecuted and imprisoned and put to death during the life of Paul. He would face the same. He wasn't concerned about those things outside of his control, but he was confident that God was in control. A lot of times we spend much more time worrying and stressed out and consumed with the struggle and 
not even aware of or or not focused on or certainly not trusting in the reality that God's got this. He says, yes, I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Do you think about that powerful expectation right there, that hope in the sovereignty of God? Next time you're facing something very painful, very difficult, and it's not brought about because of your own sins or failures or pursuit of your own lustful passions, but it is because you're faithful to God or in spite of being faithful to God. I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out. Let that be your confident expectation. Let that be your phrase. This will turn out. I know that through praying and through the work of the Spirit, because there's a sovereign God who hears my prayers, and there's a Holy Spirit who conveys those prayers to God even when I don't know what to say anymore, when I can't even put the words together anymore, He conveys those prayers to the Father, and and my God is sovereign, who's working everything out in conformity to His will. And this will turn out. We can trust in that. We can trust a God who's in control. Number five, we can choose to invest ourselves in the spiritual life and the spiritual health and the spiritual growth of others. Again, this is similar to the first. We get so wrapped up in our own selves sometimes that we forget the great joy that can be found in being a servant of God for the sake of others. Again, it's one of the tools that Satan uses so cleverly against us is to get us isolated and to get us turned inward so that our whole world is like a house of mirrors. It's all about us and all about our needs and all about our struggles. And we wonder, why is everyone not seeing me and and helping me and talking about me and thinking about me? And and surely Paul could have fell victim to that. Two years in prison? They should be writing me letters. They they, they should be encouraging me. Uh, they, They should be quoting scriptures to me. But instead, Paul continued to pour himself out. And I believe there's a spiritual formula in there, if that's the right word. I hate to use that word when it comes to Scripture. There's a, there's a spiritual principle at work here that if we will continue, no matter our own circumstances, as Paul has already written to the Philippians, to look to the needs of others and not just the needs of myself. If we'll continue to do this, there's joy in that. Look what he says in verse 25 of chapter 1. He wrote them, he says, Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. He wrote to the Corinthians, his whole purpose and the purpose of his whole ministry team was this, 2 Corinthians 1.24, we work with you for your joy. This is what I'm here for. I'm here so that you could discover the joy that's in Christ. And my circumstances don't keep me from that. When you're serving others, and you're helping them understand the one true God, you're helping them understand how that one true God makes himself available to them in forgiveness and grace, through the work of Jesus Christ, who died for their sins and rose again, and grants them an infilling of His own Spirit, who not only changes the heart, but changes the attitude and changes the power at work in us to do what God wants us to do, you're introducing them to joy, to real joy. Number six, you and I can choose to work humbly and closely with other believers in unity for the sake of the church and the gospel. Paul knew that one of the challenges to joy or gladness in Christ was the conflict the going back and forth, the discord, all the things that he'd already written about. And that's why he told them, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. There's a joy in that. There's a a gladness in God infused by the Holy Spirit that happens when God's people get together, go in the same direction for the same purpose, arms locked, as Paul says, standing side by side as one person for the sake of the gospel. There's, There's joy in that. There's power in that. Number seven, you and I can choose to give our lives without reservation for the cause of honoring Christ. Got a good email. Someone asked me, I was speaking last week about glorifying God with your life. And so, what does it mean to glorify God with my life? I began to think about that in context of this message. And I thought of this question Is God glorified by the things that you delight in? Is God glorified by the things that you take pleasure in, the things that you take joy in? Are you making much of God? Because, see, that's what Paul said the essence of his life was. That was was the purpose of his life. That's what God had made him for, that whatever had happened. If you look back in chapter 1 at verse 20, 
He says, with full courage now as always that Christ will be honored in my body or magnified in my body. Really, he's talking about a type of glory. That God will be glorified in him. When you bring God pleasure with your life, when what you do is pleasing to him, when he knows that he has your heart, not just your head, when he knows that you could lose everything else, but if you still had him, you still have joy, God is glorified in that. And I love Paul's statement, again, revisiting where we were just a week or so ago. I love what he said, verses 17 and 18 in chapter 2. He says, Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Even if what I'm doing is going to cost me everything down to the last drop of who I am and what I have. If I've got to pour out everything for honoring God. And of course, that's not a... That's not just someone sitting in a study in the comfortable chair writing this. I'm willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. That's someone in a prison suffering, ready to die for this. He says, if that's what it is, so, so be it. I'm fine with that. I'm fine knowing I'm going out having given God everything I've got, glorifying God. I'm good with that. I can rejoice in that. Can you rejoice in that? Can you rejoice knowing when you go, you've given all? There's joy in that. And that's what Paul knew. And finally, there's this. I can choose to rejoice in who Christ is and what Christ has done for me above all other things. And this is why I say, as Paul said, choose joy. Obediently choose joy. When He is far and above all other things to us, then joy can become enduring. When all other things are more important to us than God, When all other things are sometimes approaching to us the level of God, when those things are gone, there is no joy. There is no gladness. Look at what Paul said. I give you this sort of as an introduction to where we'll be next week. Whatever gain I had, broad statements, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. You get that? Everything I had, gone. I'm fine with that. Why? Because knowing Christ surpasses that. That's of far greater worth than me. If knowing Christ is the result, then I'm willing to lose everything else. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. Now listen, He said, I have counted them as loss. I have considered them is what that means. If I lose them, that's okay. Now many of you, as could I, we could say here today, you know what, I could lose everything and be fine because I can't lose Christ. It's easy to say that in comfort. Paul says immediately after that, not only have I counted them, considered them, I have lost them. I have suffered the loss of all things and I count them as garbage. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. I count them as garbage. It's okay. My happiness was not tied up in that. It was not tied up in my position as a teacher of the Pharisees or a leader of that group. It was not tied up in the wealth I would have had because no one in that group was not wealthy. It was not tied up in the affluence I had or the influence I possessed. Whatever it was, whatever again I had, that's not it. I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. He says, this is what I want. Here is my most prized possession and it's the source of my joy i'm right with god and i couldn't have earned it and i didn't deserve it it's a righteousness that comes only through faith that's the source of my joy it's what christ has done for me and who christ is he is righteous and he is my righteousness and he has given me that righteousness as a gift that can't change when you got that you can't lose that never again will your salvation be dependent upon what you do It will forever be dependent upon what God has done. He's granted you His righteousness. The righteousness of God that depends on faith. He says, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection of the dead. Here's a man whose mind had totally shifted from the stuff of this life and the pleasures that he used to think it could bring. And he says, you know what? My joy is in Christ. If that means dying like he died, suffering like he suffered, then that would mean being raised like he was raised. 
because He is my righteousness. And that's my joy. And that doesn't change. That's enduring. That's durable. This world can't touch it. The enemy can't steal it. It's there, kept in heaven for us. Here's my prayer. Same prayer that Paul prayed for the Romans. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Let's pray together. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning, let me tell you the heart of that verse, Romans 15, 13. There is no lasting, durable joy apart from faith in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul prayed for the Romans, that you would have joy and that joy would come in believing and in believing that empowering and infilling of the Holy Spirit would be yours and you would know hope. You would know joy. Hope not in this world, not in this stuff, not in all those things that you've run after for so long, but hope in Christ. That you would find Him you would find Him and find in Him joy. If you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ today, if you've never trusted in what God has done for you through Jesus and forgiving your sins and giving you life, and I ask you to do that today, what I really ask you to do is to put your faith and trust in what Jesus did as a means of getting to God, of having a relationship with God, to know God, to be right with God, to be in fellowship with God, to spend eternity with God, not for any other purpose. I don't know what God will do in your life. I don't know how God will bless you. I don't know what needs God will meet. I don't know what, what, what gifts God will give. I don't know in what ways your life will be improved. I, I don't know if He'll give you a mansion or not here, but I know He'll give you a mansion in glory. I don't know if He'll heal your body here or not, but I know He'll put you in a place where there's no crying or suffering or death. I don't know if He'll make everything in your life easy or smooth or happy as the world knows happy, but I promise you He'll give you Himself and He's a source of joy and He'll put you in a place where there is no more mourning. He wants you to have Him. I challenge you to trust Him. Lord, I pray You speak to hearts today through Your Spirit. God, I pray that Your words of Scripture today would be like flame and the hearts of those who hear today would be like grass. God, that You would consume us, reveal Yourself to us. God, that You would, br- that you would bring life with their spiritual death, light with their spiritual darkness. And God, that people would trust You and be saved today. Lord, I pray that other believers here would confess that sin, that, that, that pervasive sin that's, that's so often hidden and disguised that, it causes us to misunderstand and misuse you, to be adulterous people, to use you as a means for our own ends, to, to consuming things where we really find our joy and it's not you. God, forgive us for that. God, may we choose joy in you. May we pursue it with all our hearts. And God, I pray as, as Paul prayed, that our joy would be found in believing and that the work of the Holy Spirit would grant us hope. I pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, will you all stand? We're going to sing a song together as a song of response. And some of you need to respond today. Some of you need to put your faith and trust in this God who gives you life through Jesus. Some of you have believed information about God. You've got some facts aligned that are true. Someone has affirmed those facts for you. Someone said, yes, that's true. Yes, that's true. Yes, that's true. But as you stand here today, you've still got all the doubts in the world about where you really stand with God. And the issue is not the doctrine that you have or possess. The issue is the delight of your heart. Do you delight in Him? Do you love Him more than anything? That's got to be the clearest and plainest measure of what it means to know Christ. If you don't, do it today. Give Him your heart today. Give Him all that you have today. Some of you may want to pray about some circumstances in your life that have caused great stress or duress lately and And pray trusting in God's sovereignty to work those things out. This will turn out. And believe that. Believe that God will work things out according to His purposes and according to His will. And some of you just need to confess that you've chosen the wrong path to find your happiness, to find your gladness, to find enduring joy. And you need to turn to God for it today and find it in Him. So as we sing together, you respond. We're going to be here. If you'd like to talk with one of us about your relationship with the Lord, about how to become a Christian, if if we can pray with you, then let us do that. If you'd like to find a place just to pray right here, then you come and do that. But let's respond right now as God puts in our heart.